Welcome to Loop TV. I'm Gene, along with Andrew Ponick. Andrew is the founder, one of the co-founders of Antora. Antora makes really big batteries, and we're going to talk more about it. It is topical because investing in frontier tech and our contour of our lines, we want to figure out ways that we can get this equation to work. The equation is pretty straightforward, is that batteries are expensive to build, especially at grid scale. And I met Antora a few years ago, and Loop is an investor in the company. And it's been fun to kind of see it all come together. And would have to say, Andrew, you do an incredible job of taking a complex topic and making it simple for all of us to understand. And I'm going to turn on their superpower in a second here, but want to say that there is uh, some uh, catalyst to why we're talking about today. You recently raised your A round. Congratulations on that. That's a big step. And maybe we can um, kind of dive into uh, the exciting things that you're building. And so uh, uh, if you can just in a, in frame it in for everyone, uh, who is in Torah and what was the unique insight that you had to try to address the grid scale renewable energy uh, opportunity? Absolutely. Well, uh, thanks for the kind words and, and great to be here. So. Um, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, Antora is uh, about connecting one of the biggest uh, opportunities we have, which is really low cost electricity uh, from wind and solar, uh, with one of the biggest problems we have, which is which is climate change. And you know, the specific track that uh, Antora is looking at is uh, industrial emissions. So industry uh, produces over thirty percent of the world's greenhouse gases, uh, and that comes from a, a mix of both electricity to run industrial processes and heat. Uh, process heat for industrial processes and, and industrial processes would be manufacturing basically this would be all sorts of manufacturing this could be manufacturing sort of end products or it could be farther up the supply chain making the the metals or chemicals uh, that go into those processes got it so you've identified uh, not only the grid scale or the uh, you know the need for these types of batteries but um, why uh, why why industries why are you going for uh this segment it's, why not go for working with like power companies for example yeah it's a great question and it's certainly something that we have worked with power companies in the past we will work with them again in the, in the future but industries at a, a really unique point and again part of that is because they have both a, a need for heat and a need for electricity um, and the fact that there's two uh, valuable energy commodities for industrial customers means you can actually start to ar arbitrage them off against each other. So to take an example, you know, we're able to charge our uh, thermal energy storage system with something like low cost wind. You know, let's say it's the Midwest, it's very windy and it's night, so there's low electricity demand. That wind electricity can be nearly free. In some cases, actually, the price goes negative. So we can quickly absorb all that really low cost energy, put it in our thermal energy storage system, and then bring it out again as either heat or electricity based on what's the more valuable product to the industrial consumer at that time. So that's really why industry is a, is a unique uh, place to do this versus the electricity grid, you know, power companies, which is also uh, a segment that we're looking at. Let's talk a little bit about the thermal battery. When we think about batteries, a lot of times we think of lithium batteries and we think of the batteries that are going in EVs. And in the case of what you're doing, you're taking a different approach. And uh, I remember one of the first times we met, you uh, were kind of outlining that some of the most basic batteries are even just taking water from a lower area and moving it to a higher area during the day and then opening it up and allowing it to turn a turbine. And so it really expanded my definition of battery, but tell me a little bit about why uh, there's an opportunity around thermal batteries and how they yeah. work actually. Maybe that'd be a good starting point. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, uh, thermal batteries in general is just any time that you're doing the, the storage of the energy in the form of, of heat rather than in the form of electrochemistry like you might do with say a lithium ion battery. And one of the advantages that thermal batteries have is that you can use really, really low cost raw materials that are typically minimally processed as the storage medium. And so rather than, you know, something that might involve a lot of rare uh, minerals, you know, lithium, cobalt, nickel, you know, any of those sorts of things, you're able to use some of the cheapest stuff on earth. So in, in our thermal battery, we use uh, solid carbon in the form of graphite. Uh, you know, carbon blocks are made in huge quantities because they're used in both steel and aluminum. Uh, in electric arc furnaces and in aluminum smelting. Uh, and so these are these are huge commodities, very, very cheap, but still store energy at very high energy densities. 
And so this is something that, that I, I want to point out that's a little unique about Antorus thermal energy storage versus a lot of others, is that if you use the right material, uh, in this case carbon, and get it up to very high temperatures, you can store enormous quantities of energy. The energy density uh, of our system uh, is more than compressed hydrogen at 700 bar, which would be about what you'd have in like a hydrogen uh, fuel cell vehicle, and is actually approaching that of liquid hydrogen. So this is just a totally different mindset to be in where you're saying the, the, the storage density of this looks almost more like a chemical fuel like liquid hydrogen and less like you know, uh, a, a giant tank of molten salt, which is what uh, some other previous uh, thermal energy storage used. Got it. And how does, if you take the wind example, how does uh, a wind turbine actually get the carbon hot? Great question. Uh, it's basically like a giant toaster. So you just run electricity from wind, you know, directly through some carbon heating gotcha. elements. Those get really hot, glow, and then transfer that energy uh, throughout the system. And once the carbon is hot, it's understandable you can transfer heat out of it. How does it uh, transfer back to electricity? Yeah, so that's one of the more unique aspects of the system that you're hitting on, which is, um, you know, most thermal energy storage, that's really the, the, the kind of Achilles heel of thermal storage. How do you get that back out as electricity? Uh, typically what that means is you build a steam power plant right next to your thermal battery, and then you try to take that heat through some heat transfer fluid, pump it over to the steam power plant, and then generate electricity that way. That has all sorts of problems from an operations and maintenance perspective, from a cost perspective, efficiency. So the unique thing about Antorus thermal battery is that we're storing energy at very high temperatures, so hot that this carbon, this graphite is actually glowing. And so it's, hmm. it's emitting light like, a, like an incandescent light bulb. And so because we're hot enough that you're actually glowing, uh, you can use solar cells, photovoltaic cells, to convert that light back into electricity. So this is a fundamentally different way to, to do that conversion from heat to electricity using PV. Uh, but PV, as you know, has the advantages of being a really scalable, very simple system, no moving parts, minimal maintenance. The key challenge that Antora solved was how to make that conversion process high efficiency. So mm -hmm. in the past, most so-called solid state heat engines, so things that were able to convert heat to electricity without moving parts, were less than 10% efficiency. Antora has now demonstrated over 40% efficiency uh, for our photovoltaic uh, solid state heat engine. So that's what is really the enabling invention that allows us to take stored heat from our thermal battery and convert it into usable electricity for a customer. And you would put that kind of that that uh, capture module in between two pieces of uh, carbon, essentially. Yeah, essentially, we've got a you know we've got a hole in the in the system you could think of with a shutter that can turn it on and close that or open that, kind of turn it on and off. And then you have, yep, exactly, the PV that can just accept that light, turn it into electricity, or get closed off if you don't need the electricity right then. And I suspect your customers are bottom line oriented. They want to make the world a better place, but also bottom line oriented. What are some of the, the cost advantages that uh, you think you can deliver? Yeah, that's that's the most fundamental part of this is the cost, you know, and, and, and like you said, people want to make the world a better place, but it's uh, a lot easier to do that when it's also uh, not costing you extra money. Uh, so the, uh, the the cost of this system is about 10 to 20 times cheaper on a per kilowatt hour basis than lithium ion batteries. So this is just a, a, a vastly different uh, kind of range to be playing in for those costs. And that allows us to do lots of things that you might not uh, with conventional batteries. Got it. And I'm I'm curious, uh, given your your background and uh, the things that keep you up at night, just around uh, kind of advancing what you're doing. What what do you see like the big hurdles to face? I remember a few years ago when we talked about it, it really was the efficiency piece getting that up. I remember when we were talking sub ten percent. It's incredible to see where it's at. Uh, what what are the next big uh, hurdles convincing heavy industry to adopt? Is it something on the chemistry side? Yeah, yeah. So the, the last few years were, like you said, about proving out the technology, the photovoltaic conversion, you know, the, the storage in hot carbon. Uh, right now, going forward, it's all about scaling. So uh, that means scaling the team. That means scaling our customer base and scaling the supply chain uh, so that, you know, we really can address this massive industrial need for clean heat and power. Um, so, yeah, what, what keeps me up at night is just making sure we can continue to get wonderful, wonderful people to, to join our team uh, and, and, and keep pushing this forward. So it's less about going in the lab and, and tweaking that. I mean, you obviously want to have innovation in the product. It's more just scaling what you've built today. That's right. We have, we've got a great team of scientists and engineers who've, who've done wonderful work in the lab. There's still a lot of work to do, but 
I'm confident that the team we have can, can push that forward. Uh, but as we grow, we are going to need to scale all those other aspects of the business as well. And so we're looking for additional engineers and scientists, but we're also looking for er anyone else who can help push this forward. Well, I got to tell you, if you're interested in joining, you can't find a better person to work with than Andrew. I can speak a little bit to his team uh, back over uh, before all this started two years ago. I remember being in your office and coming past one engineer and she had a notebook with some pretty intense formulas written on it. I tend to think of myself as pretty apt when it comes to math and science and physics. Uh, this uh, was out of my league. If you think you have out of league skills here, uh, talk to Antora. Uh, thank you, Andrew, uh, for what you're doing. Fun to see the progress and look forward to hearing about some of those industrial customers that are going to be adding with that extra money that you have in the bank now to keep moving this forward. So on behalf of Andrew and Tora and Gene and Loop TV, bye for now.